So thank you very much for joining. And I love the fact that you have the pronunciation of your name uh, recorded on LinkedIn, right? So so let me try. Is the Gagnon? Is that it? Very good. Thank yeah, you. very thank, good. Thank you. Um, well, I tried a few times prior to this conversation, so uh, just to, to be on the Practice. safe side. <laughs> um, so welcome to the New York Information Security Meetup slash the Cyber Guild. It's uh, part of our you know weekly sessions, and I always bring in... Um, you know, cybersecurity professionals, people from industry, and I definitely promote women in cybersecurity, uh, trying to get more women involved in the group and, and be part of these sessions. So thank you very yeah. much for, for joining. So why don't we get started? And um, you have a fascinating background. You've done a lot. Uh, why don't we get started and kind of like just give us a, a quick overview um, how you got into the industry, uh, why you know people have interesting stories in terms of how they found themselves because you have a I looked at you have a finance background right um, so how you got into the industry and, <laughs> and then maybe kind of all by it. accident yes perfect I think back uh, back in the day nobody really you know studied for cybersecurity back when you know we were studying uh, you know we were studying business and finance and a whole bunch of other things and then. I got this job at a small, uh, small company, EDI company, electronic data interchange. And I started doing some of that and started doing some customer service for them, moved into sort of their operations. And then I kind of started feeling, you hey, were getting into a little bit of security. So I kind of fell into it all in all, like it completely did not go into finance or biology, which is where I was going next, uh, completely different realms. Uh, but security has uh, kind of caught me, uh, you know, making sure that they're uh, protecting the client's payments, transactions, all those kind of things was what we were doing. Uh, so kind of fell into it and just kind of progressed through there. And I guess, 25 years plus now in cybersecurity. Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah. No, it's amazing. You've done some uh, pretty big roles. Uh, you're responsible uh, for yeah. you know managed services on the governance side at Telus, which is a big uh, solution provider in Canada, right? Mm. Um, you've done that, uh, and you have obviously some insight to that. So fast forward to today. Uh, you have your own consulting firm, and then you also. Um, work with a uh, security providers as well. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I work with a few different security providers, um, but I am a, an independent consultant now and I work for companies, uh, you know, small, medium, large, helping them protect their business. Um, I know that some of the, you know, the biggest gaps that I see in the industry right, right now is knowledge. Um, you know, organizations don't have the knowledge today in security and they don't have the cycles, especially with COVID, um, you know, taking precedent in their business today. They don't have the cycles to focus on all of security. So it's, it's um, to me, very important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so what's your day to day look like uh, for you today, especially as a consultant, right? So you, you are basically um provide you know services uh to to as you mentioned to companies yeah. uh is it hard to juggle you know between projects i'm assuming is it project based or is it uh time based or is it uh just tell us a bit about kind of your day to day uh, what it looks like you know what it depends on it, it is project mostly based uh i would say contract based for me day to day um i could say covid has definitely put a little bit of slowness in in all of uh the day-to-day -day activities for vc so's and and consultants uh, but our day-to-day -to -day today still remains the same it's you know making sure that we're managing the trends educating our customers uh, I spend a lot of time building, you know, security awareness uh, advisories, if you will, for my customers. Um, those I find very important to help them stay up to date into what's what else is happening within the industry. What's coming down the pipe, I should say, and where they should kind of put their focus. Compliance, um, you know, I have a feeling that a lot of our organizations are going to worry about compliance come December. 
so right now they've kind of put compliance a little bit on their back burner uh, due to COVID. So we're trying to kind of bring them aware that you don't want to keep that to the last minute. So we're really educating a lot around that in the day to day activities today. Um, other things that we do, we look for threats. Um, you know, actually look for threats and communicate with other VCSOs, other consultants. Um, I help my customers build roadmaps from, you know, where they're where they need to be to be compliant to where they need to be to be secure. Um, and so, lots of stuff happening on a day to day basis. Yeah, absolutely. So, let's uh, dig a little bit further. So, you mentioned compliance and. I'm assuming that Canada is a little different. So you work only with Canadian uh, customers or is it makes Canada US? Uh, worldwide, actually. Yeah. Okay, worldwide. So perfect. So do you do you find is there any particular compliance reg regulatory compliance uh, initiatives that are more of a kind of a front burner right now? You know, we heard that GDPR was a big thing for a while there, and and so what what kind of project are, you know from a compliance? Yeah, GDPR on? from a, a global perspective for sure. Um, in in Canada, we have PEPRA, uh, so our our government regulations for privacy. Um, I know that in the U.S., uh, we're looking. You know, there's the big California one as well that uh, came up last year. Uh, so a lot of that is still um, still in the forefront for from a from a from a regulation perspective. But from a standard, I would say you're still looking at your NIST and your SAN CIS and your ISO 27001. Those are still the ones that are in the main fronters. SAN CIS with the top 20, I would say, are more uh, small, medium sized organizations are, in, are, are liking that because it's clear and easy to understand. Uh, NIST gets into a little bit more of the details of things that, you know, maybe a little bit more for medium to larger ones. And then ISO, everybody wants to be ISO certified. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I, I think it depends on the, the size and the industry that you're in. Right, absolutely. So, from uh, can you give us an idea? Maybe, maybe pick one or two recent projects you worked on, and then walk us through, like you know, what were the gaps that you uncovered, and how you helped the organization fulfill those gaps. You know, what I find in organizations sometimes they um, they try to run before they walk, in a meaning that they're trying to be compliant, but they don't have the basics right. Is that something that is uh, resonates with you? In terms of what you uh, yeah, it definitely does. And I think uh, for me, uh, <laughs> what I see is a lot of customers who just want the check mark. They want to be able to send back to their risk team, you know, their, their, their finance or their stakeholders and say, yeah, look, we got all the check marks. Um, but it's the maintenance of that that I find that they're not focusing on after that. So they'll, you know, kind of work on getting it. I mean, you asked me the question about, you know, something that we've worked that I've worked on in the past. Mm -hmm. I've worked on a lot of different projects, a lot of different styles. Um, for me, be going in and doing an initial assessment is always key. A lot of customers find that that's not necessary, but without the uh, initial assessment, it's really hard for us to determine where the gaps are and how we're gonna close those gaps and build that roadmap for them to be successful. Um, what I find is sometimes even after the assessment, we identify the gaps, and then they're like, okay, yeah, but we'll, we can deal with that later. And so the priorities shift. Uh, COVID shifted a lot of priorities this year and will lead into next year, I'm sure. So uh, we'll see what happens. But so, uh, the, yeah. the nature, what, what's, what's an assessment look like for you? Uh, and it's really interesting that you mentioned kind of the check mark approach, and maybe we can dive into that as well. But what's an assessment sure. look like for you? Um, uh, what's involved? Uh, a security assessment, it, de well, it depends where, what framework we're, we're basing it on. I typically will base it on a particular framework. So I will go in and we'll say, we'll use the top 20 and we'll validate, you know, do they have the necessary controls in place? And if they do, what technologies are they using? Are they outdated technologies? Do they have the policies, processes, procedures in place in order to maintain it? And do they have the monitoring, reporting ongoing? So there's like five different categories, right? Your policy, procedures, and, and activities, your tools, 
your monitoring, your proactiveness, making sure that they're able to continuously improve on those strategies um, are all part of the assessment. And do you, how do you collect that information? I mean, half the battle is to uncover that, right? So do you do interviews? Do you questionnaires? sessions what that process Mul like for multiple you. different strategies for that as well a lot of interviews with different players uh within the organization uh for instance a finance person should know some of the policies and processes that are to be in that are in place and if they don't it's not just IT. Like I wouldn't be interviewing just IT who typically would know whether or not those policies, tools, or things are in place. But if a finance HR person doesn't know, then we have a problem. So uh, usually that's a, an identification that it's it, it still needs to be, um, uh, it's not a global organization knowledge. So there's a gap. It's not a proper policy, for instance. Yeah, very interesting. So, and he also mentioned that, uh, you know, again, it's kind of the check mark where they want to get into that state of compliance, right? Yeah. And then there, but to you, uh, it's more than that. It's, there's a maintenance component to it. So, so once you get to that point, it's not really static, right? You Correct. have to continue to be compliant and continue working through those frameworks, right? For sure, absolutely. Uh, security is never never done but what happens uh, when you when you okay so you've done the project you brought them into the state that they wanted to be and then yeah. you leave right i'm assuming you move to the next project uh, yeah. what happens then how do you do you leave them with some tools that they have to, yes. to make sure that they're how does that tools work or or another team uh for sure so i'll make sure that they are able to maintain it uh, whether it's done through training, through my team and myself training them on how to maintain it, um, whether or not it's bringing in a managed service partner for them so they can, you know, not have to worry about the 24-7 monitoring of their environment. Um, yeah, so it, or, and I'll double check in with them. Usually I'll set up a you know, a, a quarterly kind of touch base and see how they're doing. Um, that's usually part of, you know, the consulting that we do with them. So can you share, and it's kind of a two, two prong uh, question here. So sure. typically people love to talk about their success stories, you know, how they manage to, you know, have this organization all, you know, project successful, but there's also, you know, the underside of that is not every project is successful. You know, sometimes there's certain failures, things that happen. I don't know if you can share, you know, one of each. Wow. Uh <laughs> <laughs> without without providing some, you know, like the, the, the immediate greedy details, right? Because because okay, uh, what I like to get out of, you know, because every time we go on a call with somebody, people tell you how great things are. Sure. But as you know, especially as a consultant, you probably sometimes you I'm, again, I'm assuming that again you're being called after something happened. Right, yeah, almost yeah. to clean up the mess. Yeah. Right. So. So for sure. I mean, and yeah. and sometimes they want to be, you know, proactive, and they know they have to be, you know, PCI compliant or something. Um, so they'll bring us in. I I do have. I'll, I'll talk about the latter first. Um, I I did have a customer that you know it's it's always great when you go in and they bring you in as an expert, and but truly they are the experts. Um, so it really doesn't matter what is said or what is done. Uh, you know, it's it's a matter of, or what is being recommended. It's if they believe that to be true, then, you know, they will make sure that it either happens or it doesn't. Uh, so it was a very challenging project from a, a relationship personality perspective. Um, you know, I mean, typically you go in, you're, you know, it's always happy. You're a consultant, you're going in, you're there to do a job. And that is non-political. You know, you're going in just to do the consulting role in helping them be secure. Uh, that has always been my kind of um, motto if you will 
but I did have a customer that knew better and, uh, and, and that was always very challenging every day. I would go in going, today's going to be a good day <laughs> and we're going to actually get through a conversation. Um, but the conversations kept bleeding into the next meeting, into the next meeting and, and I was finding we, we're not getting anywhere. So unfortunately, I had to pull the plug. Um, from that contract because not because hey I didn't mind that they were going to pay me for the, every hour I was there it was not a in my best interest and or in their best interest to it, we were not going to be successful together if we had continued down that path so uh, unfortunately relationships play a big role in a consulting uh, capabilities to be able to be successful as well so, too so bad there you go. yeah no too bad I didn't have a Hollywood ending I was hoping yeah. maybe like have some sort of like oh and then they're turning around and things have got got better, uh, but it didn't. So in hindsight, do you think but, that they were? Well, yeah, I did was, say I, I did turn it around in the sense that I handed it over to somebody that I felt would be more uh, in tune with uh, that particular customer, and and they were successful. So it did turn out to be you know at the end of the day, they ended up having a putting. Sounds like I'm putting myself down, but no personalities. No, no, no hundred <laughs> percent. No, a big role. Uh, the, the, you know, and people people forget the the human element. I think, and I I love this story because I I think that human element is key. Uh, yeah. it, you know, we see that a lot with organizational changes. You know, um, and I find that especially for security awareness, it has to come yeah. from the top and it has to be sort of cu cultural exactly. fit. And so I think that uh, I, I love the fact that you managed to, and also I think, I guess, from your perspective, not have this ego thing where you wanted to continue, you know, you know, basically kind of like pushing through the project despite the fact there was no fit. Uh, right. Do you think that looking backwards, um, you would have been able to uncover that prior to taking on the contract or was it something that um, I think it was uh, yeah this was a little while ago I think yeah. that would have been a, a lessons learned right um, for me for sure um, this was back in the early stages of you know kind of me building my security practice and my my consulting practice so I think so um, but I mean who's to know uh, look yeah. I mean I would think yes but uh, I mean, no, but I, have, I haven't have had another one of those since, so <laughs> let's hope they're all in the past. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. No, this was awesome, and thanks for sharing On that. You know, it really is. Um, you know, again, uh, not everything is rosy. You know, we we deal with difficult situations sometimes, and cybersecurity as a whole is a, is not an easy practice. There's a lot of different moving parts that we have to deal with, right. as you mentioned. Um, and uh, so what's the, uh, on the flip side, maybe on like the talk to us on, a, on a successful project and then, you know, now you've done many of these, right? So maybe yep. you can share something that you've uh, helped their organization. Sure. On the flip side, uh, we actually implemented uh, SAN CIS um, as a whole. It took a couple of years for us to do SAN CIS and, you know, any kind of framework does not happen overnight. Um, yeah, it can Vinesh, take. Do you, do you mind just for people that are not familiar with the with that particular framework, just give us a like a th like an elevator pitch of what that is? Sure, the SAN CIS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. So it's a security standard um, for, and it has uh, you know top twenty sort of controls and regulations um, that are best suited both from a security perspective, from a process and procedures, um, but as well from a, a maturity level, making sure that they're able to maintain it ongoingly. So it's consistently looking for um, tools, technologies, policies, procedures, and, and skills. Uh, it'll cover things like, um, you know, security awareness, pen, trust, pen testing, red team, you know, all of those kind of things, uh, making sure that you have all those processes, procedures, and elements of security um, to support and protect their environment. So, a little bit more than 30 seconds, but no, yeah. No, it's, no, it's good. And it's very popular, right? It's, it seems to be very popular um, due to the fact that it's it's not completely out there, meaning that, you you know, this is a fairly basic, right? So it's com almost like it's a it's a baseline of where your organization needs to be. Yeah, and it's, it, it, it's attainable, right? So it's not correct. like completely it has out there. About 
200 controls. Uh, so it's, it's not minimal. Um, it, it's definitely, you know, in the top 20, uh, each, each category will have, you know, maybe about uh, 10 or 15 or, or so. So it's about 200 plus uh, controls in the SAN CIS. Uh, so it, it's not minute. But what I like about it is um, it's easily uh, translated to customers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's probably one of the biggest items is, you know, the customers see that they need to meet these controls, but don't necessarily understand what they mean or why they have to be implemented. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, going back to the why we, you know, we, that's where we come in and help them understand this is why if you don't implement security awareness training, and then your your team, your your internal team will not know how to protect, you know, from a phishing potential campaign that's happening or, or phishing uh, attack that's happening. Um, so we implemented it. So I'll go back to my kind of story. So we implemented that with a particular customer. Uh, I was working with a partner at the time to do this implementation. Uh, it took a couple of years, and within that time, um, we were able to block three actual breaches uh, because of the ongoing monitoring and the ongoing support that was already started to be putting in place. Uh, and they were true attacks uh, with potential compromise, but we were able to protect the customer from losing any data and, and rejecting the ransom. Uh, before it actually hit their their environment and their people. So um, great end of story. I know it was kind of short and sweet because I explained the SAN CIS a little bit, but um, it was a, a very well successful um, implementation. And it, and it's a fantastic story, especially due to the fact that a lot of times when when a framework works yeah. and the organization does well, you don't necessarily know the impact because you know it's hard to quantify it. Right. Uh, so it's really interesting that you managed to detect the fact that there were attacks that did not happen because typically mm -hmm. that's hard to hard to to do. Right. Uh, so that's really fantastic. You know, um, I think that uh, organization now uh, and there's always this, uh, you know, like this. I saw some of these memes, right, where organization will pay, you know, yeah. two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a ransomware, but will not implement like a fifty thousand dollar like. You know, I saw solution. the same one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, 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 a, there's a few. Maybe we saw some, something yeah. similar. Um, so being proactive can save you a tremendous amount of money, right? So I mean, you were talking Absolutely. about um, this exercise was you know cost X, but they probably saved themselves ten X uh, at least, yeah. right? So that's. I the, think even with the initial understanding what is missing, forget even putting in all the controls and the tools. Like if they don't even know what they have, that's probably the biggest gap that I could see an organization, you know, having is they don't know what they don't know. Um, right. So they could, this particular customer could have been breached in the past and they wouldn't have even known it. Right, right. Right. Uh, coming back to the to specifically, you mentioned tools, right? And you mentioned that there's tools and yeah. providers. So, how do you, as an outsider coming into organization, how would you recommend? I mean, there's got to be tens of thousands of different tools, security tools out there. Um, how would you recommend a customer to, you know, if you recognize a certain gap, right, that they have and they have to require, you know, the acquire a tool or a service for that matter? Uh, how would you go about, you know, assisting them in that selection process? It's really interesting. Um, it, so it depends. I mean, I, I am familiar with quite a few different technologies um, and their capability to do the specific role that they have to play. Um, in, it depends in the conversation with the customer if they're looking to consolidate some of the tools. Um, in in I'll use the SAN CIS as another example. Mm -hmm. There's segregation of the environment. There's PCI that also requires segregation of the environment. Um, you know, so it, it does depend on the type of technology that when they are already started using in those environments. Um, you know, if they're, 
uh, I'll put a plug to Fortigate, to the Fortinet. If, if they're a Fortinet, you know, team, I'm not going to go and change their entire environment to, you know, something else. Um, although I will always recommend the best tool for the job. Um, so if they, they need, most organizations will come in. If I'm coming in, do not have a SIM. Do not have a monitoring tool in place. Um, there are a lot of great monitoring tools like SIM uh, yeah, tools. Yeah, there's quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. But which one's the best one for them? Um, right? There's the big, the big, big, big guys. And then there's the smaller mom and pop type of technology that could do some of the job, but maybe not to the efficiency that they would need or provide them the visibility that they need. So it's, it is helping them kind of pick what their budget is based on um, the capability of the tool and whether or not we're going to be changing their entire environment or not. I mean, if their environment's outdated, I would highly recommend you know, um, evergreening all of those technologies and bringing them up to, to a higher standard. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a conversation. It's taking their considerations, their financial status, as well as their technologies before making that decision. Right. And how do you um, help them prioritize? Like, let's say if someone has a budget of X, right, and they now have to buy, you know, the, the, the five tools out there, but you know, they don't know, and they come to you and say, you know, Denise, how do you, how do you, you know, which one should I pick first and take it mm -hmm. first and then come back later? You know, how, how do you help them in that process? Uh, so I think, for, so for me, it's visibility. Um, mm -hmm. So I look at visibility and protection, number one. Uh, so if I don't know what's happening within the environment, I can't protect what's happening within the environment. Um, so I help prioritize based on that, based on the visibility capability and the protection capability, knowledge, uh, procedures, policy, write-ups, all of that stuff, very important, um, but can be worked on over time. Um, better to know what, from a technology perspective, what holes they have, you know, performing a penetration test or, or you know, able to kind of dive in to see where the hackers or where you know, attackers could come in um, is very important. So yeah, visibility, um, both from an email to a network perspective, you know, SIM, um, email filtering capability uh, to then protection. Those are. Yeah, makes makes total sense. And then this is uh, kind of being proactive. What about the kind of reactive side? You know, did you get a chance to being called like, after the fact, you know, after the aftermath of a breach? Yeah, after, many times, <laughs> many times. So, um, I have, so I have a couple questions about that. Specifically, um, you know, why in general, why breaches are so hard to, to, uh, to manage? And, you know, and maybe potentially once a company's being hit, you know, how can a company minimize the impact? And what would you recommend like, in terms of best practice of what that uh, looks like? Yeah. All really good questions. Um, <laughs> let me let me start with, um, you know, how are they hard? Are they hard to detect? And, and they mm -hmm. absolutely are because hackers are spending their time day to day um, trying to come up with new capabilities and new ways of breaking into uh, an organization. Um, organizations are busy running their business. So they're not focused on filling the holes that they might have put in when they put in that new server. Um, they're not looking at it from that perspective. Uh, and, and, you know, although they should be, it's not top of their mind. I, I think we will start seeing that all, you know, as future continues. Uh, but uh, hackers are spending their time just building code and breaking in. Um, I spend a lot of time on the dark web, so I see a lot of stuff that happens there as well. Um, and um, I, I have to say credentials are still number one. Like I, I, I could find people's credentials like that. Yeah, they're cheap, I, right? No, right? And they, they, they're pretty and cheap. They're, they're they can five. be, um, yeah. you know, but they build their, their status, right? So um being able to just break into somebody's environment uh, is is becoming easier and easier um you know all the vendors out there are doing their best to protect 
um, to protect their environment and, and to protect their customers' environments by putting in the right tools and, and trying to, to um, so what I'm looking for, uh, maintain their technology with the best of the best to help protect from those attackers. But it, it, it's not foolproof. Um, even the, the sims won't catch everything, right? That, you know, we swear it's going to go and, and AI is here and, and starting to, to continuously grow. And um, there are still going to be ways for a hacker to get through. Um, but and from an incident management perspective, um, you know, those, those calls happen. So being ready for that breach uh, is one of the things that I help our customers kind of prepare for. You know, are they ready for that security breach as it will happen? Um, and so, you know, kind of going through those playbooks, tabletop exercises, making sure they understand what the next step is for them to do. Um, I've had several calls from customers in regards to breaches that they've believe they've had. Some of them have turned out to be nothing but, um, you know, somebody's mouse in their purse and acting as if it was uh, moving on their screen to an actual you know, malware that was deployed on a server and talking to other servers and trying to talk out to the internet. Um, some of which, if we have the capability and the skills um, in-house to be able to see those activities, like, you know, once the call happens to us, you know, the first thing we do is tell them to take it off the network, whatever it is, if it's a laptop server or whatever, remove from the network um, so that, and but do not, reboot and do not delete it do not you know re-image it we need the logs we need the data that's sitting on that server so um or the servers that could potentially be impacted in order to do forensics uh on those assets be, without that you know we'll just say well <laughs> good luck next time um but unfortunately we need those that data um, if we have access to the SIM, which provides quite a bit more tech information around other environments within uh, connected to that server or something that is like a network um, network tool that has connection to the network, though all that data kind of helps with the forensics investigation in order to help protect them for the next time. Um, really, the only thing that they can do once they have that been hit and a malware has been deployed is to re-image and to re-image everything that they have or to restore from backup if they have it from you know a later date. It does mean that they could be losing some data, um, but uh, I think the more important part is making sure that the data has not left their organization. So you know, fixing a server is one thing, but making sure that that data has not left with the the hackers with the attackers that the data has not spoken back out to the internet um, is, is where the focus should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of went on, so I'll, I'll pause no, no, there. No, it's interesting. And it's, you hit the nail on the head. Obviously, you know, you talked about visibility, you talked about maintaining the logs, making sure that the organization doesn't lose those. And I'm assuming that some organization, you're talking from experience, right? I'm assuming that you had cases where they went over and wiped the machine that was infected yeah. and Many now times. there's nothing. Right, many right. times. So it's almost like there's certain best practice in terms of maybe almost like a playbook, as you mentioned, of yeah. you know to run with when some you know something happens. Yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely, we, we cover all of that. So you know, what would be be your ideal customer if you had uh, a chance to to work with a with somebody tomorrow in, in terms of enterprise? You know, you mentioned you've you've done a lot of these projects. Um, yeah. You know, what that would that be and uh, maybe almost like you can provide some best practice working with with uh, security consultants again because maybe that will be uh, you know something to as a takeaway from this conversation as well. Yeah, no, um, again, great con great question. My ideal customer, I've had a few ideal customers actually, um, so I, I've been very blessed that way. Um, I would say my ideal customer would be a more of a global customer that is now building their security practice and really need to uh, start from the bottom up and, and kind of help them get there. Um, that would be uh, sort of something that I like to be challenged with and, and I've always enjoyed that. Um, so that would be my kind of ideal customer. Um, hmm. 
do you so, you, we, so coming back to that do you uh, do you prefer to start from kind of a kind of a scratch like uh you know blank page or do you as you mentioned where they really don't have it much instead of coming back into an organization where they have something you potentially have to um, modify? No, I think uh, it could be either or. I think it's it's a mindset, right? It's it's um, the stakeholders giving the approval to be able to say, you know what, if that's not working, let's scrap it and start over. Um, you know, as opposed to, or let's fix what is broken as opposed to, um, you know, kind of leaving it, okay, well, it's not broken, so let's just leave it. Um, you know, just because yeah. it's not broken doesn't mean it's it's working for you. Uh, yeah, so have that openness you know, in terms of the, yeah, exactly. Right. Like mm -hmm. the the future forwarding, the the hackers are looking to break in. So you know, we need our the organizations to feel that way to to understand that and be doing the same themselves, right? Um, I've had customers saying, "Oh, that firewall, yeah, it's really old, but it's still doing its its trick." Well, no, sorry, but it's not been updated or patched. It's end of life, like two years ago. Um, no, we need to do something now. But it only has one VPN tunnel, and <laughs> right, it, we got to move forward from that. Yeah, and, and um, organization moved to zero trust. So firewalls also are, you know, becoming right. a bit of a passe, especially now with the pandemic, where everybody is now working from home remotely anyway. Yeah, uh, so the firewall has, you know, diminished capabilities even with even with the VPN. Um, You're absolutely right. Yeah, with the multi-factor even uh, being installed, uh, doesn't really matter with everybody sitting at home. Uh, connected to their local Wi-Fi. Yeah, absolutely. So, Dinesh, uh, so where can people find you if they wanted to, to you know, get in touch, uh, get some references, some uh, feedback, and then potentially also maybe some insight to uh, to cybersecurity? Uh, Happy to, yes. Um, so they, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, so you can look me up on LinkedIn. Uh, I also have a website, um, which, uh, David, I'm not sure if we can share. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Let's sh okay. share it all, and then I'll share it also. The link is, is part of this Perfect. video recording as well. Sounds good. What, so I'll share what, all of that, and uh, and that way you guys uh, feel free to contact me anytime, yeah. Perfect. So, uh, and then I hope that, you know, you reside in um, – Eastern Canada, right? Ontario, uh, right? How far are you from Toronto? Uh, about 35 minutes from Toronto. Okay, very close. Okay, so I hope that, uh, you know, maybe like things will open up, the borders will open up again, and maybe we'll get the chance to, to uh, host you in uh, New York City, one of my monthly events that hopefully will come back, uh, coming Sounds back good. to life. But it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for sharing the insights today. Um, much appreciated. Looking forward to the next event. Thanks all for joining. Uh, Thanks, again, everybody. Take care and uh, have a great rest of the day, all. Thank you.